I'm going to turn it over to Chris Ann Marie Spencer, who is the uh, AIA Chicago Foundation president. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Chris Spencer, and I'm the president of the AIA Chicago Foundation. The foundation is an independent, non for profit charitable, charitable organization dedicated to supporting activities that benefit the Chicago area architecture community. Thank you so much for attending this afternoon. The AIA Chicago Foundation supports many projects and initiatives from architecture education in Chicago public schools, our architect in schools program, to competitions and travel scholarships, the latter of which we're here this afternoon. Also, we are in our fourth year of offering the AIA Chicago Foundation Diversity Scholarship that awards one $10,000 graduate scholarship and one $10,000 undergraduate scholarship to a student enrolled or enrolling in IIT, School of the Art Institute, or UIC. It is an opportunity to attract and retain diverse, talented young professionals in Chicago, recognizing the value of new and unique voices in the profession. This afternoon, we are thrilled to host Eric Schiller, the 2021 Martin Roche Travel Scholarship recipient who will present architecture and ecological urbanism in Tabalisi. Tel Tabalisi. Um, Eric traveled to, to, to Tabalisi, the capital of Georgia, to study the emerging landscape practices in the city. He is presently a Master of Architecture and Master of Landscape candidate at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Let's welcome Eric and learn more about Tel Abisi, its current challenges, and how students of, the, of a Georgian landscape training program are equipped with, retain, with, are equipped with resources and tools to address their city's toughest problems. Also, please put your questions in the Q&A rather than using the chat. Thank you so much. Uh, Eric, over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, and thank you, everybody in the audience for coming. Uh, so, as mentioned, uh, in the summer of 2021, I traveled to Tbilisi, the capital of the Republic of Georgia, uh, to head up a landscape training program, uh, the context and progress of which uh, I'm going to share with you all today. This trip was made possible, of course, by the generosity of AIA Chicago and instigated by rural landscape architecture, uh, who hired me as a teaching fellow for a landscape training program they were developing with the assistance of the United States Agency of International Development, who unfortunately withdrew the support the very first week uh, I arrived, leaving me and the program unfunded and unsupported at that high institutional level. If it weren't for the AIA, I would have been stranded halfway around the world with little more than the money in my pocket. So thanks again. Uh, before we get started and, and dive into some of these urbanistic challenges, there are three events that need mentioning to keep in mind that's just background noise for everything that I was up to. Uh, the first pictured here is the organized opposition to the Namaquani Hydropower Cascade Project, uh, organized in the early months of 2021 uh, before my arrival in Georgia. Uh, it was a well-organized, apolitical environmental movement to halt the construction of a large dam. Uh, and the organizers pictured here uh, put together several large-scale protests in the capital, uh, one of which I think was happening on the, the day that I landed. Uh, the second is the simmering tensions that were leading up to Tbilisi's first pride parade in July of that summer, uh, with church-backed conservatives showing up en masse to halt the free expression of sexuality in Georgia, ultimately ending in several days of rioting that shut down the city and the training program and resulted in the hospitalization of several journalists and an unfortunate tourist. And the third, of course, is the 2008 Russo-Georgian War and the ever-presence of Georgia's belligerent northern neighbor, 
Uh, I'd like us all to remember the consequences of territorial aggression and urge us all to continue to support the families of Ukraine who are facing those consequences today. But those are all unhappy places to begin our story. So where? Georgia is a very old country with a human presence stretching back over one and a half million years, back to some of the first evidence of Homo erectus uh, outside of the continent of Africa. It's the land of the Golden Fleece, the land of the Starkleys, Georgia meaning the land of the wolves, and the land of some of the oldest cultivation of wine uh, in the world. So let's start with land in Imerati in 1918. Uh, David Takhabadze had graduated from the St. Petersburg Academy studying natural sciences and traditional Georgian arts and was teaching in Tbilisi while developing his painting practice shown here. He discovered early on the allure of his home territory, Imerati, and returned to it uh, several times uh, throughout his career. He was perhaps the most prominent Georgian artist in the avant-garde movements of the 20th century and produced a wide range of abstract art. However, his studies at Imereti are some of his best known and show um, a deep sensitivity to the relationship between Georgians and their mountainous homes. In 1921, when Kakabate was in Paris, uh, the Red Army helped to overthrow the Social Democratic government of Georgia and brought the local Bolsheviks to power. This painting from 1927, when Kakabate returned to Georgia, titled Industry. The Cubist artifacts, the so-called industry, are neither totally foreign or exactly native to the Imerati landscape, uh, but they are certainly not Georgian, separated as they are spatially and stylistically from the crumbling tower in the foreground. Uh, Kakabadze's work in the 30s tried to reconcile the Soviet program of industrialization with what he views as the essential qualities of the Georgian landscape. Uh, in this painting, the dam uh, along the Rioni, the same river uh, that the protesters are currently halting construction of a new dam, incidentally, uh, is distinct in this painting from its surroundings, but not imposing. It exists harmoniously with the traditional landscape. This attitude changed in the 1940s. Soviet arts were to reflect Soviet life and show the progress of the union. For the first time, people, specifically workers, enter Kakabase's paintings and traditional land patterns are gone. The mountain is no longer a place of habitation, but rather something to be conquered. Near the end of his career, uh, the landscape of his youth is absent, reduced to nearly formless fields upon which work is performed. Georgia no longer shapes people, rather people shape the country and the earth is reduced to resource. Kakabazi died in 1952, shortly after falling out of favor with the ruling party, uh, in part by refusing to adhere to Soviet artistic orthodoxy. 30 years later, Soviet surveyors undertook a very different type of representational task, mapping for the first time in high fidelity the topography of Georgia, beginning in Tbilisi. This is a very different type of image, obviously produced for very different reasons than Kakabasi's work, but is reflective, I think, of the instrumentalization of landscape that occurred in the 20th century. Uh, these drawings are the ultimate control with a few marks of a pencil, mountains are moved, and progress is made. These drawings and drawings like these help to inform Soviet planners on the logical and efficient expansion of the city. Uh, I'd like everyone to lean in really close to their monitors uh, just to know these orderly rows of dots uh, following the contours of the mountainsides. Uh, Tbilisi had been deforested in the previous few centuries during the endless wars that plagued Georgia. Those dots represent an ambitious Soviet plan to reforest the city, lowering temperatures, adding jobs, and slowing flash floods during heavy rain events. They planted predominantly black pine, 
uh, keep that in mind because they will show up later. Now, Takabaze's vision of Georgia is not entirely made up or misplaced. It looks more similar to his paintings than not. Fields stretch along rivers, deep into mountainous valleys, uh, where the heart of Georgian culture lies. For hundreds of years, Georgians fled the wars between the Persians, Romans, Ottomans, and Russians in the plains by settling in the deep valleys of the greater and lesser Caucasus. They settled on the sides of mountains, on the tops of mountains, and along the valley floors. This village, in particular, has been occupied since the 12th century, and its shale homes incorporate early medieval petroglyphs. These places are nearly impossible to get to, uh, the roads into the mountains winding and unpaved. The mountains uh, might be where the Georgians are from, but most of them live in Tbilisi. Now, for those of you wondering how far uh, those mountains are from Atlanta, 6,308 miles. Uh, Georgia, the country, is at a crossroads. Geologically, uh, it is in Asia on a wide isthmus between the Black and Caspian Seas. And so positioned, it has long been a meeting place of cultures and more often than not, a battlefield. It is extremely mountainous. The greater Caucasus Mountains uh, contain Mount Elbrus, which is right here, uh, which is the tallest peak in Europe. Uh, the topographic variety supports a huge variety of biomes from alpine peaks to nearly tropical uh, coasts to deserts to mudflats and everything in between. It is home to 120 species of trees, 250 bushes, 4,500 species of vascular plants, and 572 vertebrate species, all of which are a mix of species typical to Europe, to Central Asia, and to the Middle East. Uh, the country has been identified by Conservation International as a global hotspot, biologically rich, but highly endangered. Tbilisi is centrally located in one of the wider valleys in Georgia. Over one third of Georgians live in Tbilisi full time, and it is likely that many more, possibly up to uh, three fourths, have a temporary residence in the city. It is very dense, uh, but generous planning for public space, especially in the Soviet era, has kept the density below that of other major cities in Europe and the Americas. Uh, its spine is the Methquari River, a fast moving body of water flanked by wide boulevards. Despite, or maybe because of its mountain location, Tbilisi is truly a water city and much of its built fabric is preoccupied with translating said water as far away as possible, as quickly as possible, uh, through downspouts, tripping hazards, channels along the sides of mountain roads, and improvised gutters, such as this loosely shaped concrete poured down the side of a hill uh, from a high rise to the river edge. Much of the existing water management infrastructure is damaged, destroyed, or close to failure. This bend in the Barry River, a tributary of the Athwari, was a particular interest to me and later the training program, uh, and is emblematic of many of Tbilisi, Tbilisi's water woes. Uh, we'll return to it in a few minutes. Tbilisi is also a place that has struggled with modernity for a long time. Uh, Soviet artifacts, for instance, this sports-themed bas-relief, randomly dot the neighborhoods, indicating or leaving a trace of some long-forgotten master plan. Other artifacts masquerade as buildings from another time. The National Academy of Sciences, for instance, in the foreground, wasn't fully constructed until the 1950s, uh, despite looking much older. Uh, and the 
glass monstrosity in the back, the Biltmore Hotel, built in 2011, uh, similarly underwent an identity crisis as they originally was uh, to be built on top of a, another Soviet-era building uh, that was later saved by preservationists. Uh, most construction in the city is opportunistic, taking advantage of any leveled surface available, and homes gleefully jostle each other on dangerously steep streets. It's also ad hoc and cheap. The collapse of the Soviet Union had dire consequences for Georgia's economy, uh, though that has recovered considerably in the last decade and a half. Even so, Georgians have inherited a difficult set of built conditions, uh, from aging infrastructure to difficult terrain, from the legacy of Soviet communal planning and the subsequent dissolution of public goods, to the fact of living in a country over a thousand years old, facing international pressures it has little control of. New construction is, of course, underway, eager to claim any piece of undeveloped land left in the Metafari Valley, while adopting ever more ambitious architectural forms. New architecture is showy, diagrammatic, and almost universally incomplete. The last three images that we just saw uh, have all been under construction for several years and have been marred by construction delays. Uh, that have left them and many of the city's other landmark projects unoccupiable. Half finished buildings dot the entire country. Uh, because of the decades of instability, many have been partially constructed for years or decades, fading into the background, uh, left unattended but for uh, the life that is already there or finding new places to take root. Everywhere, really, buildings in Tbilisi are more like scaffolding for urban plants, uh, which are largely left alone to grow and flourish, uh, making a second skin over the brick and concrete of the city. Uh, the city is full of the non-human, understandable uh, because of how close it is to the anti-urban everywhere. Mountain ridges, the one in front of us, push deep into the heart of Tbilisi, making a city of many edges. The inhospitable terrain limits sprawl uh, in many places, forcing a stop to casual construction. However, the hard soil sheds water very quickly, putting homes at the foot of these slopes uh, at risk of flooding or landslide. The Soviet tree planting program helped to stabilize some of those slopes, and the root networks improved water retention uh, on the mountainsides. However, the close planting of those trees, coupled with a changing climate, have proved to be a perfect mix for pine-killing fungi and pests to move in. Many of these pines, if not most of these pines, are dead or dying leaving slopes around the city brown and barren. Uh, the black pine was an introduced species. It was successful in other parts of the Soviet Union, and so the planners thought it would be successful here as well. Um, but they just weren't particularly well adapted to Tbilisi's climate, even when they were planted uh, 60 years ago. There are plans underway to again reforest the slopes, uh, so long as there are slopes to reforest. Housing demand is high, and developers are pushing deeper into the mountains to provide it. Uh, note the building on the left of the image, tucked underneath the ridge, or rather, forced into the ridge. Contemporary builders learned well from the Soviet master planners, and often think that the best mountain is the one that is no longer there. Grappling with Georgia's difficult terrain is usually the greatest concern for builders, uh, but it's not just a matter of removal or reshaping. 
the instrumentalization of landscape has diminished in many ways its cultural value, uh, especially within the city. Rather than an asset, the mountains and streams are often viewed as nuisances or blank slates. This attitude, together with inefficient government services, has contributed to widespread illegal dumping of household and construction waste. So much so, in fact, that new landforms are entirely constructed of trash, forming ridges, peninsulas, and earthen dams. The Georgian government has specifically identified illegal dumping as a major environmental concern. Uh, as filling the river valleys leads to water impoundment and the creation of unsanitary marshes. Extreme weather events uh, threaten to overflow or wash away the trash mountains, unleashing huge volumes of water, a potentially deadly risk. Couple this with an undersized and poorly maintained channelization and piping of mountain streams, as well as those river edges uh, that we looked at earlier and the ongoing development of new construction in floodplains. And you have a recipe for disaster. In 2015, the very river flooded, overloading the capacity of key tunnels. 19 people died as a highway and significant portion of the city within the very watershed was destroyed. A report shortly thereafter inventoried the city's problematic waterways and strongly warned against continued development in fragile watersheds. This report formed the basis of the landscape training program that I developed and is instrumental in understanding some of the most pressing issues in Tbilisi. So why firm-led training anyway? Georgia is in a tough spot. Uh, some of its greatest challenges come down to thoughtful landscape architecture and engineering, but there are no landscape programs in the uh, Caucasus region. Landscape education uh, got its start in the United States and has found an eager audience in Europe, in China, uh, but has yet to make inroads, uh, especially in West Asia. Uh, this map is showing university landscape architecture programs that are reporting to international organizations, uh, such as SELA or EFLIS. Um, the nearest program to Georgia is over 350 miles away uh, in Trabzon, Turkey. I joined Rural Landscape Architecture as a teaching fellow in order to develop a pilot training program to train university and mid-career students in landscape architecture fundamentals. Uh, anyone who has taken a summer course uh, in preparation for a graduate design program uh, should be largely familiar with the format and concept. Uh, when the program was funded by USAID, our focus was explicitly on jobs training and skills development in order to place students in long-term roles in at Ruderal, um, and other architecture firms in the city. Uh, that focus shifted somewhat when USAID withdrew support uh, to focus more on theoretical issues uh, that are probably more similar to a design school course. Ruderal is, to my knowledge, the first and only dedicated landscape architecture firm in the Republic of Georgia, uh, founded by Sarah Colt. When I was there, it was a collaboration of three US trained landscape architects uh, and two Georgian architects. Uh, two of Rudol's employees, Bardo, uh, all the way on the left, and Dato, uh, right there in the middle, joined the summer program to supplement their undergraduate training in non architectural disciplines. Uh, Rudol's project, Arsenal Oasis, constructed for the 2020 Tbilisi Architecture Biennial and winner of the 2021 uh, Land Design Special Jury Award was predicated on discovered faults in Tbilisi's water delivery systems and launched landscape architecture to the front of urbanist discussions in the city. Uh, this project was later instrumental in parts of the training program as well. 
So in addition to Dr. Lombardo, four university students formed the core group of the program. Uh, Aveta, Ani, and Tamari were all studying architecture at their respective institutions, uh, while Tim, a German transplant in the Caucasus, was studying environmental management in Scotland and interning uh, at the firm. Uh, the students were deeply embedded in the office culture, if only for a lack of space. Uh, they worked at the only table large enough to seat them all and would have to clear out once or twice a week to make way for client meetings. The core of the class was a set of instructional modules I developed based on effective lessons that I personally have gone through, as well as input from Sarah, who gave me access to her own portfolio of lessons from a long and successful teaching career. Uh, those lessons were compiled into a set of four landscape training manuals, uh, the first two of which are pictured here, that have remained with Rudrol and are being translated into uh, Georgian versions as well, and will help to structure future training programs uh, should they continue. Uh, so in the next part of the talk, I will take you through some of those key lessons and uh, what the students were up to last summer. Uh, so the best way to understand landscape, I think, is to get it under your feet. And hiking through the city and its environs were a key part of learning. Uh, early on, those walks were paired with those same Soviet topo maps that we looked at earlier, which are still largely accurate. Students were asked to pick uh, snapshots or segments of these maps at random, and with binoculars on a high ridge, uh, attempt to find those landforms in the city. So the combination of walking and looking and learning from uh, previous examples, uh, we're all combining to build an intuitive sense of landform. At the same time, students were learning how to pay close attention to smaller details and introduced to principles of survey at a uh, one meter scale. Um, Using what they learned there, they improvised new measuring tools in order to measure rapid changes in one of the valleys above the city. If you were wondering what had happened to that mountainside a couple of slides ago that was being removed, uh, this is your answer. Gravel fill in the Brazoskevi Valley up to 10 meters deep that the students are walking on top of here. Uh, just to give you a sense of the scale of that shift, this is the uh, River Valley 12 years ago uh, when development was just starting to creep up into it. Uh, it was slow at first, uh, but sped up considerably with the construction of this apartment complex. Uh, that's the mountain ridge that was removed. Uh, like a shoebox, is, these apartments were just slotted in and the valley totally filled uh, the rest of the way up. These sorts of changes are happening faster than planners can keep up with them uh, and have dangerous consequences. Uh, with that in mind, we turned next to the Ferry River Valley uh, and the site of a major infrastructural failure leading to the deadly 2015 flood. Um, this bend in particular uh, was heavily blocked by debris from the mountainside um, just around this building in the background. Um, there is a tunnel uh, that moves the river underneath uh, a highway uh, that whose capacity was exceeded during this flash flooding. So this whole area uh, was backed up. Uh, so beyond the relatively new and already failing concrete revetment, the site is largely untouched by the city. Students spent a full day by the riverside sketching and taking photos uh, before returning to the office to learn about and draw uh, landscape sections. Um, with special attention paid to the interplay between the city and the landscape, in order to build student sensitivity to things like soil composition, a site's relationship to infrastructure 
in habitation, in storytelling. Uh, the student who drew this section shared that in the aftermath of the 2015 flood, uh, dozens of zoo animals were set loose when the zoo was destroyed, uh, with hippos wandering down streets, big cats lurking in the parks, and a giraffe wandering down by the river. Many Georgians will swear that they have seen the giraffe, uh, the trouble being that the Tbilisi Zoo never owned such an animal. The students uh, were invited after that to the village of Dusheti by a friend of the firm to spend a week at their cottage uh, in that village uh, to develop some master plan scenarios for a tourist ranch uh, that they were dreaming of. Here again were slopes and pine forests and the exercise was a major step in terms of complexity and scale. Uh, landscape architects from Rudral uh, came one at a time to spend a day in Duchetti to lead workshops with students on programming, plant ID, and representation. And the students worked collaboratively uh, to develop a range of options uh, for this hypothetical ranch to discuss with the client and uh, their representative. They had an opportunity during this to uh, discuss tourism and tourism infrastructure uh, with a hospitality uh, consultant, um, who again was a, a friend of the firm. Uh, their most major project, and the one that most closely resembled a studio design project, was Arsenal, uh, the site of Ruderal's most recognized project, the largest piece of publicly owned land in the city, and a constant reminder for an occupation for older residents. And this is the gate. Arsenal shows up on the oldest maps of the city, like this one from 1735 uh, in the middle of the page, or later in 1867 in a higher resolution. Uh, by this time, the Russian Empire had annexed Georgia and had begun construction of the fortifications on the ridge. So that's right here. Uh, those fortifications continued to develop into the 20th century. Uh, this snapshot from a 1924 map. Arsenal, you can see, being terraced and expanded uh, at that time. And ultimately, at its peak in the 1980s, the Arsenal in Tbilisi was an imposing compound sitting, as one resident put it, like a scarecrow above the city. Uh, this is Arsenal as it was in 2001, before it was fully decommissioned. It is a small town of barracks, workshops, armories, and mustering fields for armored infantry. If you look closely at this image, you can see rows of field cannons and supply trucks. In 2006, it was ready for demolition. In 2011, buildings had been cleared, leaving only the foundations, which crumbled, and slowly faded. Traces of road still remain, as well as the odd remnant structure. Uh, so this is Ben, one of the landscape architects at Ruderal. Ben has a drone, which is very excellent uh, for understanding a site of this scale. It is a long, even ridge uh, that had been terraced over uh, several decades by military engineers. It's bound on the now left and right, so the north and south sides, uh, by deep river valleys uh, and totally surrounded by the city. So pay attention to that ridge. It can give you a sense of just what a drop off that is. And then Arsenal Oasis coming into view. The student's first job was to talk to neighbors, uh, some of which we'll hear at the end of the presentation. Uh, they were collecting stories and rooting the place in collective memory. Uh, the Oasis was a natural spot for on-site classes, and the students visited several times throughout the summer uh, to mark changes uh, with the season. I mentioned earlier that the Oasis is made possible by the failure in the water delivery system of the city. 
uh, you can note the spray right behind him, uh, which is coming from an exposed pipe, possibly uh, the, a water connection to an old barracks building, for instance, uh, that had been capped, uh, but ultimately failed releasing water just in this one area on Arsenal. Uh, so we walked all over uh, the site as well and discovered a major branch um, of the uh, water main that ran just underneath the surface. Everywhere the site was hot and dry, uh, but for the massive steel pipes that were cool with condensation. It didn't take long to find out that the water was leaking, dramatically so. Um, supporting pockets of verdant vegetation in the lower valleys. The students uh, were then asked to go through a series of exercises, reinterpreting uh, the arsenal through collage, investigation of local non-human communities, as well as mapping historic conditions and topographic analyses. They worked through models and section with special attention paid to the non-human to develop a set of proposals for new gardens and new oases, often reusing on-site material in abstract compositions, as well as explicit constructions. The goal of the program was to help students see landscapes and Arsenal in particular, not as blank slates or exploitable resources, but as sets of relationships between human and non-human forces. This culminated in a show put together with and hosted by the Center for Contemporary Arts in Tbilisi. Uh, in part, the show was to give students the opportunity to see their own progress uh, all up on the wall, all at once, but also to show the range of landscape visions at work in the office. Students pinned up work next to some of Sarah's artwork and drawings produced by the firm on real projects. The show was as much about introducing landscape architecture to Tbilisi as it was about showing off student work. There's a desire for this type of work in Georgia and the students are eager ambassadors for it. Uh, more of the work, the draft sections, models, drawings of arsenal, plants collected on our walks. Uh, the show was scheduled for a single night, but after a strong opening uh, with probably 50 to 60 people in attendance, uh, the gallerist asked us to leave the work on the wall for the next few weeks. He reported to me that everyone he spoke to was uh, tremendously excited about this type of work and that this type of work was being done in Tbilisi. Uh, keep in mind that this was at the same time as large environmental protests um, and just a general sense of frustration that things don't seem to change. Uh, but this was an inherently hopeful show that was all about creative futures. Uh, for Tbilisi's landscape. So the real success of this program will, of course, be measured by the students' future choices. Uh, one student has already joined the Ruderal team and by all indications is eagerly embracing landscape architecture. Uh, and another told me that they are uh, seriously considering graduate school uh, in landscape architecture once their undergraduate studies are complete. Uh, so over the course of the program, several ideas emerged that could help structure future training programs, um, which uh, I will share with you all here uh, in case anybody has the opportunity to influence programs uh, like this at their own institutions or firms uh, or elsewhere in the world. Uh, so the first is that Efforts should be made to let practice influence education. Uh, the training program was a firm-led initiative. Uh, unpaid students shouldn't be asked to complete billable work, but they could be given assignments to supplement firm projects. Possible examples include unbudgeted community engagements, such as the interviews they did with residents, uh, additional site analyses, or ecological research, 
or even precedent preparation. Uh, attention should be paid to establishing mentor-mentee relationships, uh, which I know is something that everybody always have in mind, but is particularly important in places like Georgia, where students after completion of the program don't have many avenues to practice uh, this type of work, but for the relationships that they establish while in the program. Uh, the qualitative research unit uh, should be expanded. Uh, talking to the people most affected by a project or process reveals design insights, unknown histories, and valuable counter narratives. Uh, furthermore, the ability to talk to people, ask questions about the preferences, and present oneself professionally in ambiguous situations are all important skills uh, for young designers. Um, language accessibility is obviously huge. Uh, I have barely a working knowledge of Georgian, um, and it was often the case that uh, my lessons would not translate exactly to uh, Georgian students. Uh, so always keeping in mind the needs of your students, especially when working overseas, uh, and finding ways to make sure that either you're communicating as much as you can through universal languages like drawing, uh, or working closely with a practitioner uh, who speaks both the instructor and the instructee's uh, native languages. Uh, future workshops, such as the one that we did in Duchetti, uh, could adjust their priorities to focus on client-student interactions. Uh, learning objectives can be established for clients as well as students. Uh, the workshop could adopt co-design strategies in which students are facilitators and assist the client in determining design priorities. Not only are there not landscape architects in Georgia, but there aren't people asking for landscape architecture projects. It's just not something that has been worked out uh, for a lot of potential clients. Uh, finally, the summer training program can be a powerful tool in a broader advocacy and development strategy. Uh, relationships can be established with universities in Tbilisi, um, architecture practices in that city, and arts organizations like the CCA to improve recruitment and retention uh, and to develop a network of like-minded practitioners and advocates. Similarly, establishing relationships with universities abroad will direct students and funding to further initiatives. Uh, okay, finally, I'd like to close with a video uh, that was included in the show at the CCA about Arsenal. Uh, the interviews are in Georgian, um, so I, I apologize for not having subtitles, but it was for a Georgian audience. Um, but the speaker is relaying some of the history and impressions of the site that I have already shared with you. Uh, after the video is finished, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, if you just feel free to put those into the Q&A as the video is playing. Uh, thanks again all for your time and attention. Now, Arsenali. საფრთხო <laughs> Tell me, you met this. Is Shani Quackness Roy was Gideho? Is the Rusetis, Ego Sparsetis, Ego Osmaletis, Araso de Sarcopilla Shani? Amasia Sacre. Oh, I talk with the Aga Chagi Swas of Tobela. I Osmaletma, Sparsetma, Nere Rusetma, Gadboi Baras, and what got them quit of it, or yet as hood.
Amitomats istoriyulad budmivat iqo es adgili samkhedro mishnalobis samkhedro mishnus kone shesamamisad budmivat iqo ak iaraqebi shesanakhi ben sinakhavden ragaza zarbaznebs sinakhavden mere uqo satanko batalionebi ragatsebi da rato mokhta man da mainz am teritoriyaze da aras tbilisis sva teritoriyaze ai kvevit amkhares sadats rkinigza gadis tu khar tabuevi pirdapi shemodio da rkinigza და მოსკოვიდან ლენინგრადიდან იქედან აქედან უკლე შავი ზღვის გავლით პირდაპი შემოქონდა ტყია წამალი ტექნიკა რაღაცები და აქ ინახავდნენ ამ ყველასთვის და ბეტერები ტანკები ასე შემდეგ და აი აქ იყო ერთ-ერთი ძირითადი ნუ აქ მარტო კი არ იყო მარა ნუ ფაქტობრივად აღმოსავლეთ საქართველოსში ერთ-ერთი და როგორც ცნობილი ერთ-ერთი ასე რო თქვა წაკითხული მაქვს რაღაცას ეწერა რომ ამიერი კავკასიაში ერთ-ერთი უდიდესი ნაწილი იყო ესა Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, 
I just checked the Q&A and I don't see any questions there. Um, do you see anything on your end? Yeah. Well, uh, if there are no questions for Eric, um, thank you so much, Eric, for your presentation on architecture and ecological urbanism in Tel Aviv. Did I get it right? <laughs> Tell it Tbilisi. Um, it was really interesting and the landscape is beautiful. Um, and I can see that you're really passionate about the work that you're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody.